Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. This way, we'll, this day, we will have a somewhat abbreviated discussion due to some technical issues on my part. So let's jump right into our study. We'll bring everyone in. Gentlemen, it's good to see everyone this morning. Hope you're all doing well. Good to see you, John. I'm well, doing fine. <laughs> good. All right, so where we're starting at today is going to be John chapter 5. And we're picking up right around verse 16, John chapter five, there in verse number 16. And because of a miracle that Jesus had just performed, and more importantly, him having done it on the Sabbath day, we see a, we're about to look at a movement that's going to develop that will result in the death of Jesus upon the cross of Calvary. And so let's go ahead and pick up a reading there in verse number 16. Mr. Paul, would you mind reading for us from verse 16 down through verse number 23, I think would be probably good. Okay, I can do that. John 5, uh, 16 through 23, and I'm reading out of the New King James Version. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. <clears throat> then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to all uh, to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. All right. Thank you, Paul. When we start back, having looked here at verse number um, 16, Paul, and looking in this particular section here, um... Jesus' comment here, well, not just his comment, but this whole statement. Who is he identifying as his source of authority? From especially well, for their perspective. Yeah, he's going. Uh, he's saying, you know, God works all the time, basically, uh, and I, he's looking to. Uh, he refers to him as his father. That he he associates himself with deity, but he certainly looks to his heavenly Father. He looks to God as the one who uh, is the source of that authority. Uh, they're accusing Jesus of working when he said, take up your bed and walk. You know, it, it's, it's kind of a ridiculous thing. Uh, he, just, he just uttered a statement, but they had their own traditions and, and rules and their own view of things, uh, even if it didn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, and so here they accuse him of working on the Sabbath but uh, Jesus here, uh, it was the work of God that was being done. And why should they question that? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, from, from their perspective, he was a regular man just like us. You know, just like them standing there. Um, and so for them to kind of grasp the concept, it's going to take a while for them to do that. Despite the evidence that he's showing to them, they're very, obviously very hesitant. But... This idea, and I like the point that, that you reminded everyone of, is that he was working, They the charge was that he's working there on the Sabbath day, but he makes a statement there that up until now his father's been working and I have been working, um, showing everything that he was doing. And not just this miracle, but anything that he had done preceding this point, he's giving credit to to the father, to God in heaven, making him his, his father there. Um, but as we go through here, we're going to see see at least this method of, of uh, presentation here 
Jesus is going to lean heavily on the fact that God is his father and that he is doing God's will. Um, he's, he's going to, going to lay heavily on that and that he could not be here if it was not for his father, giving them that authority again, from their perspective, any, any other thoughts or comments, Paul, or, or any, anyone else as we, as we walk through this section here. Um, I, I just find, I just yeah, find ahead, it interesting Brian. that there, um, that the conversation here is um that uh verse 18 is such a profound and important idea for us that anybody who's not clear about jesus being god in the flesh verse 18 is a verse i like to kind of highlight in my bible i don't know if our listeners highlight their bibles i always like to mark verse 18 i like to say hey look here it's clear when you're saying jesus is the son of god especially that turn that that expression only begot which means the same the son of the nature of god you're saying he's god that uh, that that's the declaration that is being made. That if Jesus is the Son of God, He shares the nature of God. He is God. Uh, he has the divine nature in Him. So um, I, I like the fact that they're understanding that idea. That by this claim, it's a important, it's a significant claim. So uh, that that expression is very important. I think. That's a good point. All right, any other thoughts on that? Let's see. There was one thing that really called out, uh, jumped out at me. What, what was it? Um, yeah, he really drives home that point about him being the father, him being the son of God. But whatever, what, what he sees the father do for whatever he does, the son also does in the like manner. Um, so verse number 21, he'll show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to whom he will. All right. First off, when he makes a statement here about showing and he will show him greater works than these, what's he talking about there? What is he leading up to with this? Probably a greater number of works rather than a, a greater, uh, rather than a greater quality, a greater quantity. Okay. But could this be... thought... oh. oh, go ahead, Brian. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Paul, 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 go ahead first. I think Paul was ahead of me. I was going to say, I, I, I took this a little different, and, and maybe uh, maybe I'm reading more into it than, than is necessary. But as I looked at this, I was thinking about uh, those things that would uh, accomplish salvation. I, I guess <laughs> I was thinking about quality. Uh, only in the sense of not greater as in uh, things that they would find, you know, well, it would be water to wine, which is greater, water to wine or or here healing someone, rise, take your bed and walk. But I was thinking more about uh, ultimately the resurrection, uh, crucifixion. That's just how I was thinking. Uh, that may not be what Jesus had in mind. Ryan, I'm sorry, I kind of stepped over your words. Not at all. Um, I actually uh, kind of wonder about this one, too, in, in terms of, you know, is he talking about more works? He is going to see a lot more works. But also, I wonder this verse 21, he says, the father raises the dead. Well, really, the father, the only person the father is going to raise from the dead that I can, you know, when I think directly of that thought is Jesus. Um, you know, the Bible specifically says repeatedly that the father, that God raised Jesus from the dead. But Jesus raises a lot of people from the dead and Jesus will raise us from the dead. The Bible says later on. So I kind of wondered if maybe the greater work that they're going to see is the father raising the son and that because the son is raised from the dead, like first Corinthians 15 says, the son will be able to give life to those whom he will. So I kind of, I thought maybe that was the thought too. And I like the idea of it being the majority, you know, the fact that we're going to see a lot of works. Um, I also kind of like the idea of looking specifically what's coming. Yeah. You know, and uh, I, I kind of lean toward what you're saying there based on verse 21 that oh, I think ultimately this is one of those statements that, that he's looking at his resurrection. You know, when you look at the miracles that are recorded in the Bible, and I'm talking about all of them, go all the way back to the beginning. Um, what miracle is there that is greater than God raising Jesus from the dead? If you can categorize miracles, maybe with the exception of God speaking the entire universe into existence. You know, I mean, you could possibly say Genesis 1-1 is 
the greatest of miracles, but but beyond that, raising Jesus from the dead the way that he did after after three days, after being mauled and tortured and and just everything else associated with that. I mean, that's just the greatest of, uh, if, if you categorize miracles, it, it, it certainly would be, it certainly would be in the top five or, or whatever you would say, or I, I say the top one as far as that goes, so. You know, listening to you guys' comments, you really broaden broaden my understanding already. Uh, I mean, I was so limited in my earlier comments, but a uh, couple of things, or, or three or four things I want to point out, and I want to go back to verse uh, uh, verse 16 here, uh, where he says, uh, the, where John says this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. And I think when Jesus says what he did, did in verse 17, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. I think he's hinting at the fact that they don't really know what Sabbath keeping is all about. They don't really know what what is involved in breaking the Sabbath. It can't mean that there's no kind of work that can be done because the father has been working. I mean, has been working. My father has been working. And so this is past i think this goes all the way back to the to the origin to the creation he was working through the creation then he took a a one day break from the creation but everything every prophet ever did as far as uh, uh prophetic statements to confirmation of the prophetic statement as the word of god god did all of that when elijah and elisha raised the dead God was giving them that power, so he raised the dead. And so when Jesus says, uh, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do, he had seen the father raise the dead. And he knew either intuitively or by observation that God had done this on the Sabbath day. Uh, and so what Jesus did cannot possibly be a violation of the of the Sabbath because he calls upon the example of of his of his father. And then he says, uh, uh, for the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. And so the father was very open with the son concerning all the things that he himself uh, had performed. Uh, and then he says, uh, for as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to him he will. And and I realized that I was very uh, short-sighted in, in my earlier earlier comments on the quality of these of these works. But the Father had been raising the dead. He said raises the dead. That's uh, uh present tense and as i understand it it's a present tense that began in the past and it has always been uh been true whatever god does he has always been uh been doing in one way or another but then when he says even so the son gives life to whom he will that to me in contrasted with raising the dead means he's going to give spiritual life and so I see there an allusion to the convert to the, the possibility of conversion, uh, conversion being made possible of the new birth through the new covenant. And so this was yet in the future. Not that people hadn't had change of hearts in the past. They certainly they certainly had, but nobody had ever been born again so as to qualify them for entrance into a uh, the spiritual kingdom. And so I think there's a hint there in verse 21 of uh, of that particular thing. And, and that would indeed be, as Paul pointed out, the greatest work of all is to make it possible for us to enter into the eternal kingdom of God and therefore the eternal heaven. Okay. All right. I think th those are really good points. Um, 
And and it, I I think a combination of all those is really to, to would be the takeaway from this. Um, we we kind of we kind of see a progression. And I don't mean so much stair step progression with the miracles of Jesus, but we see Jesus healing the sick. We see P Jesus's power over nature. When he multiplies the food, we see the power of Jesus over nature. Also, when he, he calms the storms um, and, and the seas. But a time will come when he will raise the dead. Okay, think about the, the, the widow from Nain, her son. And others who he, as in Lazarus, will restore life to. And in the course of this, he shows them that clearly this is coming from the Father. Kind of... You think about what verse 20 says, he will show him greater works than these. Well, such as what? Well, I like where we ended up ultimately our spiritual resurrection from, from the dead, Ephesians chapter two. All right. Ultimately, that's where we're going to with this. But from their perspective, what would be some of the greater works? He's even going to raise the dead. And we know that the father is able to raise the dead, but the sheer fact that Jesus himself, the son will be able to give life to whomever he wills. In a physical standpoint, is a great sign of the power and authority he would have when he eventually would would give this uh, life, spiritual life, later to whomever he will. Um, and kind of following up with that, he makes the point: the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Building on that idea of life to whomever he will, the Father's given him judgment to be able to do that, so that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Talking about making himself equal with God in the eyes of the Jews, this is going to stimulate even more so the pursuit of um, his death. Yeah. Any thoughts? You know, I think we need to keep in mind also that Jesus never acted unilaterally as a person. Okay. Every Because they were one. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit were one, not one person, yeah. obviously. But they were right. united in everything, uh, and each one, each one had his particular role in the scheme of redemption. The father, uh, the father planned it. Uh, the son oversaw it, and the uh, and the Holy Spirit uh, confirmed it all, as well as the Holy Spirit had a, a wide role, a, a wide range of roles in that. Uh, mm -hmm. He revealed it, he confirmed it, and uh, enabled the apostles to confirm it. And uh, But no, no one of them ever acted unilaterally. They were always together uh, in the performance of their works, even though each one had his own personal uh, responsibility in it, per personal uh, role in it. That's a good point. Good point. Any, any other thoughts before we bring in a couple of comments? All right. Let's go ahead and bring in, and Caleb uh, made a comment here. Let's go and bring it in. Uh, sorry, it jumped to Davis. Let's see if I can get Caleb's up there. That's an old comment, too. Bear with me just a second. One more time. Let's see. There it is. Um... See if that did it. One more time. There we go. So the first comment Caleb makes was uh, Jesus also gives credit to God and does not take credit for himself. Um, Moses failed to give God credit when striking the rock. And that's a very good point. Okay. Very good point with that. And then later, Caleb then says, I have been studying through the silent period of the Bible and looking at the Mac Maccabean rebellion. He says, how can they justify defending themselves against the foreign military yet criticize Jesus? Any thoughts about that? Well, Jesus didn't, uh, he wasn't a militarist. Uh, and I think that's why they did not respect him uh, like they, like they should have. They, they respected military might because of the concept of the kingdom being geopolitical rather than spiritual. And okay. so Jesus didn't fit the bill when, when he fit, fed the 5,000, as we're going to read about in John chapter six, when he fed the 5,000 men, not counting women and children, 
they think, well, this is a fellow we need to 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 head the kingdom. He can feed a uh, feed an army on a shoestring budget, and uh, so they try to make him king. But this was not the kind of king he came to be, and and I think he made that obvious enough in his uh, in his preaching that day that they decided, no, this ain't the one. <laughs> This ain't the guy that we need uh, because okay. of their misconception of what they needed. Uh, Caleb modified his comment. I think what he was, was saying, how can they justify defending themselves on the Sabbath against the foreign military yet criticize Jesus for working on the Sabbath? Caleb, is that kind of what, what you intended there by that? I think that may be. Um, you know, something else. And I don't know if this would have much to do with it, but they had already fought off the, the Maccabean uh, revolt had fought off um, Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth and the the leaders surrounding him effort to quell the uh, Jewish worship of of God, bringing in uh, Gentile influence extremely. So they had already withstood an external leader, and so. Maybe within Jesus, they also saw another threat trying to take over them. I'm not really sure. I really think it was more jealousy of him. Um, but but anyway, that, that's a good question. They, But, you know, people do it that way. They defend their own actions when it's justified. But when someone else is doing the very same thing, or at least closely equivalent, well, it's a different story. They're not allowed to do that, but, but I was. And um, anyway, I don't know if that is relevant, but. And if he had been a military leader, they would not have found fault with him. Yeah, because he'd been standing against Rome, you know, yeah. doing their, their bidding, trying to overthrow Roman government. Yeah. And that's what they were, they, isn't that what they were expecting the Messiah to come? Based on their interpretation of some of the things that Isaiah wrote, they were expecting the Messiah to overthrow the Roman government. And it's interesting that when they bring him to Pilate to get the death sentence, they accuse him of, of being the very thing he denied that they wanted. Yeah. Uh, someone who would stand against Rome militarily. And so they put told Pilate, you know, we'll pressure you. We'll go over your head. We'll go to, uh, to Caesar. You can't be Caesar's friend if you don't put this man down for his opposition to Caesar. That's right. Yeah. And Caleb goes on to say, shows more of the hypocrisy by the Pharisees. And that's right. Um, one more comment real quick, David Clark, and we are in full agreement with this. He says, God's power is endless. Even could raise the dead, give life to whomever he wills. It's a good point. Very, very good point. All right, let's go ahead and move on into the next section there, 24 through 30. And there's really not... It's not a good breaking point, so let's go ahead and read this one. Mr. Uh, Tom, would you mind reading for us verses 24 through 30? All right, so uh, verse 24 through 30, and again, the New King James Version. Jesus goes on to say, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of God. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming, in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing as I hear I judge and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. All righty. Thank you, Mr. Tom. So in this next section here, as Jesus continues talking, Notice his statement there that he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. That goes back to and the son can give life to whomever he wills. But here, Brian, he's or, or Tom, he's not connecting this with giving life to 
raising the physical dead, he is assigning this to give life to whomever he wills to eternal life, to of um, avoiding the judgment has passed from death to life. Would you say that would be right? Um, yeah, um, he is. He's definitely doing that. But one of the things that I find interesting about verse 24, looking this up, is, you know, some will take this verse and, and plug it in and say, this is the plan of salvation. You know, as, as in all you have to do is believe, you know, that type of a thing. But what's interesting about it is the word here and the word believe that are used in here uh, are present tense words. You know, so so Jesus is talking about ongoing, ongoing action. And, and, and so he's basically talking about those who are willing to follow him and those who continue to follow him. And, 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 I, and I do think he's making, I do think he's making a de declaration here because this is, this is one of these, uh, for, for lack of a better term, this is one of those occasions where Jesus is being antagonistic with, with the Jewish leaders, and incidentally, rightfully so. You know, Jesus needed to challenge them. And he needed to challenge them over and over and over. And and that's what I see him doing here is, is you know, they've criticized him for healing on the Sabbath. They've criticized him for claiming to be God. And now taking it even further, you know, those who, those who, who are following me, those are the ones who are going to have the hope of eternal life. And, and they're not going to, they're not going to come into judgment. And the word judgment that is used here is, obviously a reference to the negative aspect of judgment or, or condemnation. And I also see in that an implication that Jesus was saying that uh, you all are going to come into this judgment. Okay. All right. What, um, Tom, I just saw a comment you had dropped in our private chat with Zoom. And um, that is just in case you don't know, um, and you probably already do know this, Caleb, he mentioned the Maccabean Revolt and the Antichus Epiphanes the Fourth. That was all about 147 BC, if memory serves correctly. So that was about 150 years earlier than this conversation that Jesus is having with the people, just kind of for whatever that, that's worth there, kind of put that into a, um, a, a time period yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, and of course, historically, these leaders would have been fully aware of that, yeah. but it, but it wasn't local to their time, yeah. Uh, which uh, just kind of blends into the conversations of so. Yeah, that's true. That's true. All right, so Brian, you got any thoughts on this? Is or Tom, or Tim, Bob, whoever you are, Bob. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I, a couple of things. I I'm trying not. To I've got some comments here on, on the, the entire block, but I'll, I'll just mention a couple of them in relation to the first two or three verses here. First of all, this entire block, 23 through 30, Jesus is explaining his relations to man. And in verse 23, he has the right to divine honor. Uh, God has honored him and will continue to honor him. And he himself has a right to be honored by man on the same level as God the Father, because he is uh, he is God. Secondly, he has the power to impart spiritual life mm -hmm. through the forgiveness of sins, both under the law during this period uh, that he was on the earth. He could not necessarily suspend the law. Of I guess he could do that. I'm not sure that he did do that. But he did forgive sins uh, on occasion without demanding sacrifices first. And But in the case of the, uh, the ten lepers, he cleansed them and he told them, you go and show yourself to the priest so a sacrifice can be offered to uh, on your on your behalf so he has the power to impart spiritual life and then in verses 26 and 27 authority to execute judgment and uh and so these are the first three points that i would make in in regard to jesus showing his relations uh his relations to man uh the right to deceive uh, to receive 
divine power or divine honor, the power to impart spiritual life, and the authority to execute uh, execute judgment. And this, I, I don't know how much they understood. Uh, I guess there were a few astute people there that would have understood. Uh, even, even those uh, Jewish rulers might have understood the implications but resented them. Uh, because at, at this point, they are still up in the air against Jesus and uh, or up in the air with regard to Jesus. And so these are some these are some high and mighty claims for a mere man. Of course, we know that he's yeah. not and was not a mere man. But those are those are some of the things that I had uh, that I had noted. OK, Brian. Uh, one thing I like about this, uh, one thing I like about this passage, we know there's a doctrine that floats around today called the 70 AD doctrine that, that and part of that stipulation is that there's an idea that the resurrection of the dead uh, isn't something that's going to happen. It's a past tense thing, and they'll connect it to being born again, for example. This is a great passage because it's clearly delineating two ideas. It's saying that there is a uh, coming to life that occurs when a man hears the word of God and obeys it. Um, and I would liken that to what John says in Revelation 20 about the first resurrection. And then there is a second coming to life. <clears throat> Excuse me. That is uh, in the future. And he, he stipulates it. You know, one is coming and now is and one is coming. And the one that is coming is a resurrection of all mankind. You know, and uh, verse 29 and a right, the righteous and unrighteous are raised up. Uh, kind of sounds a lot like Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. And so I like this passage because I, you know, this is one I kind of keep in my mind that if I bump into somebody who's not clear about the resurrection or uh, has some question about the distinction of being born again versus being raised from the dead, I really like this passage because it nicely delineates the two ideas. Okay. You know, kind of corresponds to his statement to the Samaritan woman in chapter four. Uh the the uh, the time the the hour is coming when we shall neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father, uh, but all men shall worship in spirit and in truth. And so there, as as Brian pointed out, there is the hour, and then there is the hour that is coming, the hour that now is, and the hour that is that is coming, and that is a clear delineation. Of course, there are many, many of these found in the New Testament. This AD 70 doctrine is so convoluted. Uh, it's a wonder people anywhere can understand it well enough to accept it. Uh, but there are so many passages like this that totally refute it. Uh, the, the, the woman married to seven husbands, for example. Uh, the Pharisees couldn't wrap their minds around that, so they were denying the resurrection. Well, that's a form of A.D. 70. If 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 everybody died and, and nobody was resurrected after A.D. 70, they would believe not even in a resurrection of the nation. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point, Brian. Okay. All right. So I want to I want to draw back to a point here real quick. Um, earlier in the text, we saw uh, Jesus saying, "For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father." All right. So he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now let me kind of slowly scroll down to where we're at, verse twenty-five. Notice here he says, "Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is," which has already been talked about. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. I think that's significant. He's kind of following in that same mindset of showing and establishing his authority there. It doesn't say the dead will hear the voice of God, and those who hear will live, but those who hear the voice of the Son of God. And then again in verse 26, he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also. Then he says, because he's the son of man. Now we're flipping the reference there just a little bit. 
Now he pulls into his discuss his conversation the Son of Man statement, which comes from Daniel, was it chapter seven, where we see kind of the introduction or the prophecy there of the Son of Man. But it's interesting. He's really hammering home the point of his authority. Now, later we get to the chapter, get on into it. He will talk about how that if I testify of myself, my testimony is not true. And he explains why well, talk more of a legalistic sense. There has to be two others that would testify to him. But then we get chapter eight, I believe it is. He fully is and does testify of himself. Um, but any thoughts or comments about that? There in verse 28, uh, as was pointed out a while ago, do not marvel at this for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. So, and I think, Bob, you were talking about this a while ago. This clearly, do you believe, is talking about the judgment towards the end? Uh, yes, I, I think. Yeah done good to the resurrection of life to done evil to the resurrection of damnation condemnation so one resurrection mm -hmm. but two destinies of those who are resurrected yes and they happen at the same time they are the same hour they're not a thousand years apart uh and and again if ad 70 is true then there would be no resurrection of any kind until AD 70 and no yeah. resurrection of any kind after AD 70. And so yeah. the only resurrection would have been the one in AD 70. And, and I just still can't wrap my mind around who they say is going to be resurrected. If it's the nation, I guess they would have to say it's spiritual Israel that is to be, uh, resurrected, but, uh, somebody's being condemned in what sense was anybody condemned just by not being resurrected but if if they were condemned just by not being resurrected then there's no resurrection to condemnation yeah and so i don't see how you can fit ad 70 in there at all uh and and any number of arguments as brian pointed out uh could be made against that because yeah. it's simply not true it reminds me a lot of the Jehovah's Witness idea of the 144,000. You know, you got the special resurrection, but everybody else will still have something or another. Everybody anyway. but the 144,000 will live forever on earth with Jesus. Yeah. That's they don't their even idea. Want, they want to What's be on that? earth. They don't yeah. even want to go that way. They want to be on earth. <laughs> yeah. All that's right. Where Jesus Let's see. Yeah. yeah. Right. He says, I can do, uh, and so coming back to this, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own, but the will of him who sent me. Okay. Any additional thoughts or comments? That last statement emphasizes that he does not act unilaterally. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Even in the judgment, he will not act unilaterally. You know, sometimes when, when, when a leader, a king, will send out someone on their behalf, the king is not present to oversee every simple thing, but he trusts the person to work within the scope of the king's wishes and desires to properly represent the crown, I guess, if you would, when they are, you know, 200, 300 miles away. But we're not talking about this. Everything that Jesus did was the will of the Father, the will of Jesus, the will of the Spirit, just as, you're, as you've already explained. Yeah. All right, any other thoughts? I will say sometimes Jesus' mm -hmm. language on judgment can be a little confusing here. Um, Jesus has said earlier that the Father has uh, given authority to the Son to execute judgment. Uh, verse 22, the Father judges no one. A little confusing because later Jesus talks about the idea that he'll judge no one. Um, and that could be a little confusing, except the point that Jesus is trying to make is this idea of a righteous judgment. In fact, judgment is one of those key words in the book of John that comes up a lot. He'll talk about the need for righteous judgment. Um, he'll talk about passing from judgment. 
And it's not exactly saying um, <clears throat> you might contrast that with what Peter says about, you know, judgment begins with the household of faith. It's not as though we're, we're completely devoid of judgment if we're in Christ, but we're not going to be held accountable for our sins if we're in Christ would be the, the more important way of looking at that idea. But Jesus will tell us later that the concept of what it is that's going to judge us is twofold. Number one, it's going to be our words and deeds that are judging us. And number two, it's going to be his word that he that he establishes that's going to hold us accountable to those things. A little bit confusing, you know, because uh, sometimes people will want to take that word judgment and try to run with, well, look, Jesus isn't going to judge me. God's not going to judge me. You know, I'm. I'm not going to be judged. Wrong. You're going to be. You're going to be judged. You're going to be held accountable for things. And and Jesus will, you know, as we wander through the book of John, there'll be some other statements about judgment that that bring this up. So it's important to understand Jesus is not giving somebody a, a rain check to say, hey, if you're in Christ, doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to be judged. Not at all. Um, he's trying to give, of course, the idea to say that that there's a this forgiveness of sins takes away an accountability for those sins that are forgiven. And that's the that's the impression that he's trying to get across. I wonder too if the idea is also in that statement. I judge no one. If that doesn't contain the idea of uh, my judgment is not arbitrary, because we I've given a standard. My Father and I and the Holy Spirit, we have given you a standard by which your your actions, words and even thoughts will be weighed against and and so uh yeah i'm not gonna i'm not arbitrary i'm not gonna i'm not by arbitrary i mean the same thing that that the bible means when it says respect of persons or partiality uh that's not that's not him he judges impartially and he judges on the basis of his revealed will and whether that is reflected in our lives or not. Well, John 12, he says, I did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. But then in the next statement, he says, the word that he teaches is going to be that which judges the world. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Any other thoughts? Paul, you've been eerily and oddly quiet today. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, I didn't have anything to add. I was listening uh, as closely as I could. Um, I need to have a cricket button that plays crickets. Yes, that would be good. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's see. Let's bring in David uh, Clark's comment real quick. He says, in Christ, out of Christ, everyone will be judged for their works. And I think that's a very important point for us to continue to remember. Everyone will be judged. It's just what side are you in Christ or out of Christ when you stand before the throne? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. We, we have to picture judgment in the way that we do because we are very are carnally minded. We live in the flesh. Yeah. Think about those, the drawings or the cartoons years ago where you would show a long, seemingly endless line of people at the gates of heaven waiting to be judged. You know, and so we kind of picture that we will in turn go and stand before the throne of God and be questioned and grilled and interrogated about the things that we've done and all that. But that's the way that mankind pictures something like that with our heavenly father. It is much more certain, you know, I mean, you, when, when you die, then you will have to give an account for the life that you've lived, whether you were in fellowship or not in fellowship. It's a judgment day will either be a day to mourn or a day to look forward to. So, yeah, even the parable of the sheep and goats in Matthew 25. Yeah. It's it's a it's a, a representation uh a, a figurative representation of what's going to take place. It's not like God has to group us all and say, "Okay, uh you guys over your 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 goats, you go over here, you you sheep, you can come over here." Uh he already knows and I think we, to some extent, already know. Uh, I'm not saying there are not going to be any surprises. Some people can deceive themselves. But uh, as I've said in the past, judgment is not about deciding. It's about uh, sentencing. 
I think it's a good point. It's a good point. All right. I tell you what, let's do. It great. is. Or go ahead. Another thought. I was going to say great profile, Brian. <laughs> oh, that was his better half. Keep turning away. Better yeah. side. By the um, way, before you, before you say anything else, John, I do yeah. want to say I was watching an old episode of Truth Factor uh, the other day. And the reason I was attracted to it because Brian and Brian Garlock and I were guests. Oh, that's right. And, uh, and I noticed that uh, Brian Haynes was on the panel. And I, I couldn't figure out who he was. I thought, the guy looks familiar. I ought to know him. But he had no facial. <laughs> so it was like a cue ball. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, hey, I was I went back, I did was looking back some of the first ones in twenty twelve is when we started. And um I don't recognize the guy on there. He had darker hair, nothing here. You know? Oh, yeah, the guy that was sitting down, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the guy was sitting down at his desk, yeah. And, and no facial hair. Yeah, yeah. Y'all remember the time the closet shelves in my office fell? We, I, I think Royce Bell was on with us. Now, Brian, just probably before Brian's days, now that I think about it. And I'm sitting here, all of a sudden, it was a crash, yeah. And Royce is the only one that, that observed it. He says, what was that? <laughs> and I'm spinning back and forth. Oh, I those were the days. The, I remember the time while well, we were reminiscing for just a second uh -huh. that uh, we got done with our study and you guys all said, uh, Paul, are you okay? And oh, uh, right. we think you might have had a stroke because my face was drawn on the left side here and I had developed Bell's palsy and uh, lasted for weeks. Uh, seemed, seemed like forever, but it lasted for weeks. But you guys were all I think maybe you ought to see a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> you probably had seen a doctor, right? Not prior. No, it happened actually during the, uh, the study. study. My oh. face just started going. Yeah. You know, further and further well, yeah. while we were studying. He said something yeah. the spirit didn't like. So, I mean, it's. <laughs> I was cursed. Well, on, on that note, we are we're at the top of the hour. Um, let's plan next Thursday to continue our study with John chapter five, verse thirty-one. Um, and we, I'll make sure everything is working. I thought it was working before. We'll make sure everything is working so we get started on time. Um, any other thoughts or comments? Listen, I appreciate you joining the study uh, today, and uh, we really, really appreciate um your participation your interest in these things if you've heard something that maybe you have a question about you can send us an email write us at questions at truthfactorlive.com you see that on the screen questions at truthfactorlive.com or you can email us individually as you'll see there john at paul at uh, truthfactor.com and we'll definitely do our best to get back with you and if it's about something we've said in a study we'll then try to address it during our next study all righty. Well, I appreciate everyone's participation. We'll plan to continue this again next Thursday, 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time, picking up in John chapter 5, verse 31. Y'all have a wonderful week. Bye-bye. You too.